Thank okay. you. Okay, sit down. Yes. Wow, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, warm welcome to Berlinale Talents. A warm welcome to Hau Hevela Mufa. Very nice to have you here this afternoon for a very special event. You can see we even bring two hosts. Yeah, uh, intersectional cooperation. Intersectional cooperation. But uh, this actually is a really good uh, keyword because what we do at Berlinale Talents is, of course, well connected with the rest of the festival. It is actually coming out of this deeper source of the festival. Um, and this also naturally leads to cooperations. And one of the very long-standing cooperations we have with the Deutsche Kinematik Museum for Film and Television, uh, which is again, and Rainer will let you know more about it, uh, well connected with the retrospective. Uh, this year we have a very special guest here, 
but also you have a lot of films and a lot of special guests there, I think. Yeah, no, normally we uh, are the curators. Our team is the curator of the um, retrospective, but this time we choose differently and we asked 28 filmmakers, directors, actresses all around the world if they could choose a film related to our theme, um, Young at Hearts, coming of age at the movies, um, and um, almost nobody said no because <laughs> I'm too busy. Um, they all embraced the theme and choose films. So we have 28 films chosen by 28 famous filmmakers, and these are very personal choices. They choose films which meant a lot to them, um, and this film, uh, or this filmmaker, you are going to see soon. Her film was chosen by Ava DuVernay. Um, it's called Sugarcane Alley, and you can see it tomorrow. It's also a cooperation. Uh, tomorrow it's a cooperation with the section Generation, and on Friday. And uh, the director will be on stage very soon. Um, but that's perhaps your part. You have to invite the... Uh, host and the guest. Yeah, that's true, that's true. Um, no, honestly, I will uh, make that very brief because uh, we mentioned uh, everything, but we haven't mentioned the name. And allow me to invite you to Claire Diao. Uh, Claire Diao is the moderator of today's session, and Claire is a film critique, uh, curator herself, uh, also a, f a talents alumna and close friend of our uh, chosen family of Berlinale Talents. Claire Diao, please come to us on stage. Hello. And without Hello. any further ado, uh, we let the show begin. Claire, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you to all of you to be here. I'm really honored. As I said, I was a Durban talent back in 2012. So enjoy what you're doing now. You will see in the future. It's super. <laughs> uh, I would like to bring on stage someone who was uh, who has an extremely brilliant career and who is still alive, which is really important to say because uh, sometimes we only honor people where, when they passed away and she is here to exchange with you. So we want to make an intimate conversation with you talking about her career, about filmmaking. She received on November 19, 2022, an honorary Oscar award for a career during the 13th Governor Award Ceremony. Please welcome on stage Mrs. Ozan Palsi. Thank you very much. So, how have you been? Are you happy to be here? And are we ready for a nice, intimate conversation exchange? I didn't hear you. Yeah. yeah. Good. Okay. So we should stand up because it's like stand up, stand tall. Exactly. <laughs> so this was the speech you made on November 19 when you were awarded. And you said something really important. I would like to introduce this conversation with that. You said at the time, black and women were not bankable. And you say now black and women are bankable. What was the change between the 80s when you started and nowadays? When, uh, <clears throat> when I started uh, with Sugar Cane Alley, it was absolutely, um, I don't know how to say that in English, le parcours du combattant. That mean, uh, um, le parcours du combattant, that means when they train people to go to the war, you know? It's a long way and a lot of obstacles and danger. So uh, it was very hard because I was a, a woman, a young, a young woman. I was uh, black. <laughs> so, and I was from, uh, I was coming with a movie, um, a project set in uh, the Caribbean, Martinique. Um, there is no white lead in the movie. So, all this was presented like obstacles. And I decided to follow what my grandmother always told me. If uh, 
you have a project, if you want to do something, and you have faith in what you want to do, and anybody comes like this and says to you, no, you cannot do that, you cannot go over here, I mean, it's impossible, um, and they put a fence in front of you, just jump over it and fly. <laughs> so that's my best advice to you all here. <laughs> So you see behind us her brilliant filmography. Can you please raise your hand if you have seen at least one film of Azan? Mm -hmm. So it will be a mix of discovery yes. and uh, uh, knowledge. So in 1993, of course, Sugarcane Alley, and she became the first female director to win a French César thanks to that, but she was also and moreover, a Silver Lion at Venice Film Festival and Best Actress for um, Lead Actress Darling Legitimus. Then we had four years later, um, she traveled overseas and she went to the United States to find a major studio, MGM, and she shot a film about apartheid, a dry white season you see on top over there. Then in 1992, she came back to the French West Indies, this time in Guadeloupe, for a musical tale called Simeon, with uh, two lead actors who were part of a really well-known musical band called Casave. <laughs> <laughs> there are some fans of Casave. Yeah, Perfect. <laughs> and then in 1994, she directed, against maybe her agent, <laughs> documentary about Aimé Césaire, who is a, a really important figure in the French West Indies, but also in for all the francophone, yes. black person talking about negritude and so on. Aimé Césaire, who was a poet, a writer, and a politician, and who su supported her in and her career. My, and in my spiritual father. Yes. And in 1998, she went back to the US uh, to direct for Disney a feature film called Ruby Bridges, who retells the story of a little girl back in the 1960s who was the first black girl to go to, to school in New Orleans. And to a then, white school, we have to be said. Oh, yes, white school. Forbidden, you know, for years, and yes. in 2001, The Killing Yard, so again, a really strong topic because uh, she dealt with the 1971 uh, riot in the Attica prison in the United States. And 2006, she went back to the West Indies, the French West Indies, to uh, uh, meet all the survivors of the Second World War who joined the resistance to deliver France. But because they were from the West Indies, we never heard about them. It was called the Journey of the Dissidents. And in 2007, she went to another island in the Indian Ocean, the Reunion Island, with a TV series in two parts called The Brides of the Bourbon Island. But now let's go to a film that is the first one you made. You were 25 years old. Uh, you discovered a 12-year-old book by Joseph Zobel from Martinique, and it was called Sugarcane Alley. And so 13 years later, you directed it. It was your first film. But as you said, you were coming alone from Martinique. You had this project. What was the reaction, and how did you manage to produce, to direct this film. Yes, as I said earlier, it was uh, very, very difficult for all the reasons that I, I, uh, I explained. Um, and uh, even if I had a, a very important grant from the French government, uh, the National Center of Cinema, precisely, you know, to, uh, you know, to make that movie, because it's, that grant is one third of the budget of the film. And, um, but even though, I mean, my baby was not attracted. Nobody wanted to do it because it was a story about black people and no white lead and so. And I was a young filmmaker and kind of pioneer, you know, because we were not that many uh, female directors at that time. Uh, so um, I, I will make a long story short. Finally, finally, um, because what you had, you, have, uh, you had uh, that grant, you had 18 months to find a producer. And if you, you don't find a producer after the 18 months, months, you lose that grant. What was terrible, <laughs> because it was the first time that somebody from my country had 
such a, a grant. And, uh, and I, it was hard on me to lose it. And finally, I, I, I met someone who believes in f uh, movies directed by women. It was Claude Nejar. Um, he was a producer and distributor. Um, and uh, he produced Little Nemo. I don't know if that will, if you, anybody here saw the movie, but La Vieille Dame and Zinia, for example. Um, and he loved that film. He fell in love with a story that nobody wanted to even read. And also Jean-Luc Ormière, another young producer. And thanks to them, I was able to have the, get the money with the participation of Aimé Césaire, that very important uh, man from uh, the father of the Negritude movement with Senghor and Damas, for people who know about a bit about it. So I was able to gather, you know, that the money, necessary money to produce the film. You know, I'm not a producer on it because I was young, I didn't have a company, and I wanted to make that movie. So now I would do it differently, you know. And I did after that, you know. Yes. Um, and uh, yes. Did you receive any advice when you had to sign contract and so on? Because we're talking to filmmakers sometimes. Yes. You're super happy to have a producer, but you don't really know yes. what you're signing. I was very fortunate to, to meet uh, one of my mentors, Tr Francois Truffaut. Um, I loved his movies, and I was dying to meet him. But I was saying, well, hmm, I, w I will never be able to meet Truffaut. Like some young filmmaker might think, well, Spielberg was here yesterday. So how many of you guys wanted to meet with Spielberg? I said, well, it's a, a long shot, you know. He's here, I can see him, but I will never, I don't have the connection to get to him. That was the same thing with Truffaut for me. And, you know, God made it easier for me because as a, as a, a student, one of my roommates was at school with uh, Francois Truffaut, one of his daughters, Laura Truffaut. And, and then because I used I was all the, your network. <laughs> yeah. And I was the only student uh, at the, uh, the um, residence uh, for student. University yeah. housing. Yes. Uh, uh, learning, you know, uh, cinema, about cinema. And so I used, I already wrote Sugarcane Alley. And I will read every new scene that I will write. Every Saturday will be in that beautiful garden with tea, coffee, and cookies, you know. <laughs> and then I will read the, the new scene or sequences that I, will, I, I wrote. Every week we will do that. So, and my friend said, but you know, uh, you know that I, I know uh, Truffaut's daughter, you know? Why, why not? And I know how much you love him. So we can make that happen. And that's how Laura came to, my, to, to our residence and uh, and we talked, and she told me when the script was finished, she said, okay, uh, give it to me, I'll give it to Francois, because that's the way she was calling her dad. And I said, mm, I don't know, you know, you give that to somebody you admire for so long, your first script, you know? And I was a little bit shy about it. And finally, I let it go, and I said, okay, oh, yes, okay. And uh, maybe a week later, um, Suzanne Schiffman, who was a truthful right hand and script, you know, uh, called me and said, uh, Mr. Truffaut wants to see you. And that's how I met Francois Truffaut. We discussed, he loves the script because we had a lot of theme in common, you know, the education, you know, coming of age and, you know. Um, and he gave me some advices, you know. And after that, um, I, I got the grant from the National Center of Cinema and he tried to help me to find money, you see. But uh, people will welcome me because you will see, yes, because Mr. Truffaut is recommending me. Yeah. But at the end, when I would go to the meeting and they would see that I'm, I'm black, I'm sorry when I talk like that because I had no problem with my, uh, my skin color. And, but that's the truth. And I'm here to tell you filmmakers the truth. I will never lie to you, okay? So um, I, I want to sh I'm here to share my experience with you, not to lecture you, but to share 
my journey with you. So when you leave that theater tonight, I would like you to, I would like to be able to see that I gave you something that might be useful to you. That's why. So I, I will tell you, I will call a cat a cat. Uh, and um, so they will say, oh, okay, well, we'll call you back. And you, they will never call, you know? Anyway, so I was able to um, make the film, and Trifo supported me. Uh, and um, that movie that nobody wanted to make um, went to Venice Film Festival. And the movie had uh, uh, the lion, the silver lion, and I was the first black female director to have a lion at that time to get it. <laughs> Thank you. And also the grandmother, Darling Legitimus, had best, the, the award for best actress, what was another premiere for a black woman in Venice and also in Cannes, we never had that before. It was a, an event. Um, and the movie also had four more uh, awards. And guess what? I say that because it's very funny. On the spot, the first people who bought Sugar Cane Alley, you will never imagine who they were. The Japanese. <laughs> the Japanese. Because I tell you, simply because the movie is a universal story and uh, speaks to everyone, whatever your race, your, your, your beliefs, or your religion, or I mean, you see, your culture, it's a universal story. So let's watch the extract to see how it is universal. Sugarcane Alley.
Thank you. So, I would like to do the Nico Kieka film. Do you want to do now? Yes, I want to. Yes. So, your film Sugarcane Alley was selected by Ava Duvernay as part of the retrospective of this year, the young, of art, young at Art, Coming of Age at the Movies. And uh, for those who are interested, the film will be screened tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. Uh, at the Zoo Palace 1, uh, animated by Chanan Turan. And it will also be at Kubix 3 on February 24 at 5.30 p.m., moderated by Rena Ruter. Uh, I just want to say a little quote from Ava DuVernay, who picked the film, to know why she chose it. In her glorious debut feature, Mrs. Palsy waves a spellbinding tapestry of humanity. She places us directly on the island of Martinique, offering all the texture and tenacity, the warmth and wonder, the beauty and bravery of the people there. Her camera captures a complicated history with intimacy and immediacy, ensuring that we will never forget José and the journey of a people that must be long remembered. Thank you to her. <laughs> She's good. Thank you. And I think that was certainly the most challenging, like to put on screen people that were forgotten and whose history was forgotten. If we go back to 1983, can you please tell us how did you build your crew? Did you have some people from Martinique working on set or did you have to bring everyone from France? And just to precise to the audience who don't know, like Martinique, Guadeloupe are French departments. So they depend from France, but they're far away. They're in the uh, Atlantic Ocean. They are close to the United States. And there is this strong, strong uh, fight and historical relationship with the metropole, like the mainland, because of the slavery history. Well, at the time, uh, there was nothing, um, no, only theaters, beautiful theaters to, you know, for the movies. Um, but no school, you know, nothing, <laughs> just theaters. Um, so it was a big challenge, but, uh, but I, I, I knew that I had to make that movie because I was uh, 10, 11 years old. I used to ask, I love to go to movies. Movies always been one of my, the love of my life. And when I was a little girl, every Sunday I will go to the movies. And, uh, but I, there was no black people on screen, um, no characters, except, you know, one or twice you have a movie coming from America with black characters oh, and always in degre very degrading parts. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that will upset me as a child. And I say, but I don't understand why it's, a, it's, it's like that. And, uh, or we are absent on the screen, and um, and we and I, I couldn't understand it, and uh, I kept ch questioning my parents, my mother, and one day she said she wanted me to get out of her hair. You know, she said, "Okay, you sit down here, stop questioning me," and um, that's why you know they call, they used to call me my nickname in Martinique when I was since I was a child was Mademoiselle Pourquoi. Yes. Pourquoi means why? Miss why? Miss why? Because if you ask you something and you say yes, that's fine. But if you say no, you better give me a, <laughs> you better give me a good explanation. Why no? You know. Anyway, so and then she said, okay, sit down, and she gave me the book. She said, read that book. Don't cheat because I read it three times. You know, and I want to know everything that's in that book. But she didn't know by doing that very simple gesture to get her peace that that will create a. A, I would say a volcanic thing in, inside me, you know, uh, it, it was an eruption, as we say in French, you know, um, because for the first time I had a book in my hand that was talking about black people. We didn't have that. I nev we never had that at school. Okay. So, and I saw my people, people that I knew, the sugarcane plant, uh, you know, uh, workers, their children, all medus, people that I, I will, you know, I've seen in my daily life. So, um, and I fell in love with it, and I, and I shared that book, and I said, okay, I want to make a movie with that. I didn't know how, you know, but I knew that I had to do it. 
And I grew up like this, praying God every night, please make me go fast, 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 so I can go to France and study films and make, make, turn that movie, you know, that book into a movie and show to people who we are, you know? And that was my obsession and that's what I did. It was, and you know, already we talk about <laughs> the whole difficulties and done. And the movie had, I mean, internationally, the movie had uh, something like more than 27 awards. International awards, and still today, people it's a classic, and the young generation they love the movie, and uh, so so that's fine. So even if you have uh, some non-actors on the film, there were also some actors, and we talked about Darling Ladies yes. who was awarded. But you also transmit a lot of things. You talk about education, and we and we've seen the first scene regarding that. But you also try to bring some of the West Indies culture. Can you please tell us more about the Yer Creek, Yer Crack? <laughs> well, so because she's asking me to talk about Yer Creek, Yer Crack, I will ask you to do something with me. Okay. So in Martinique, it's a tradition, in Guadeloupe too. Sorry, and Tahiti, absolutely right. We have a Haitian woman here, a sister. Yes, <laughs> okay, wonderful. So before, you know, in, like in Africa, because we, are, we came from Africa as well, with the Caribbean people, we are African descent, okay? So before starting, you know, a story, the, the storyteller will say, yeah, creak, and the audience has to respond, yeah, crack. Then he said, yeah, mystic cri, yeah, mystic crack, aboubou, bien. So we'll do that and we'll start talking, okay? <laughs> so I'm going to say, yeah, creak, yeah, yeah mystic cri, yeah, creak. Aboubou. Good. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> okay. okay. So now we can start, you know, our conversation, you know. <laughs> yes. As we will talk about many films, I, I, I just want you to tell us on set how it was. For people, did they realize you were shooting a film? How did the people react when you come, like with your camera and... Oh, yes. So I had to bring uh, my crew from France, mm -hmm. but I, I made sure that the, the people, I mean, the assistant in all the departments, they would be local people so they could learn. And um, because this is very important for me, I mean, education, learning, transmission, that's key things, you know, in my life. Um, so that's what I did. And we had a fantastic, fantastic experience because the people from the country, every night, they will be looking at television, the news, because <laughs> they will tell them, oh, okay, so tomorrow, uh, Miss Patsy will be shooting that scene because they, they read the book. The book was a classic <laughs> in Martinique. So they knew what scene that I will be shooting and people will come from, all villages, you know, to the set. Teachers will come with their students, their pupils. And they knew that they have to be very disciplined. You don't talk when you said action. You don't talk. <laughs> Silence. And, uh, and people, the population will come and give me, the one who had money will give us some money to buy things, or they will bring objects from the period, uh, period pieces, you know, object from uh, the 30s and that they, they had been cherishing for many years. They will bring that to us because, you know, we needed that at Pops. Mm -hmm. So the population followed the entire shooting. And when the movie came out, um, you have people who never went to a theater for 40 years. And you had old people coming on wheelchair people with their can, you know, and beating the, you know, <laughs> beating the young people. Get out, this is our story. Okay, let us go, let us, you know, let us get in, <laughs> you see. And one told me something that moved me to tears. He said to me, an old man, he maybe was 90 something years old. And he said, miss, now I can die. Wow. Because at last, at, we can see ourselves on the screen. 
and it's beautiful. Can you believe this? That's true. So it's up to you in the room. We can make the Q&A with the audience at the end, or you can raise your hand and ask questions about Sugarcane Ali or Aishan sister has a question. Yeah, quick. <laughs> yeah, quick. I'm okay. from St. Lucia, which is right next door to you. Yes, I'm from St. Lucie. Just St. Lucie, no capale coyolo si. And like that gentleman said, I saw Ruka's Meg for the first time when I was a student at UWE in Jamaica. There was a course in cultural studies called Caribbean Film and Their Fiction. So we had to watch, we had to read the book and watch the film. And your film is the reason I'm here today. That film is the reason. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's a series of insane coincidences, curated coincidences, as um, Florian keeps on saying, because in the application they asked us, who would you want to ask a question? And you were one of my questions. I wanted to ask you a question. <laughs> yes. Perfect. Yes. No, it, it gets even nuttier. It goes further. <laughs> And there you are. And today, that jacket that you're wearing are the colors of the St. Lucia national flag. Today is St. Lucia's National Independence Day. And I'm here with you wearing this that I bought in Martinique in <laughs> December. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, anyway, for your work. It was the first time that I saw my Creole Caribbean culture on screen. I remember my response was visceral. My ears started ringing. My, I saw this vein in my arm popping. Mr. Meduz and what he was saying about Africa, everything. So thank you. It's an honor for me to be here, to see you, to be in this session. Thank you, Berlin Ali. Thank you, Florian. Thank you, everybody who made this happen. This is a dream for me. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And also, I have to say that I did not write the book. And so we need to say thank you to Joseph Zobel, who was from Martinique and spent many years after uh, the war uh, in uh, France um, as a, a, a principal of a, a college um, in, in Paris. Um, this is an autobiographical story that uh, the little boy is Joseph Zobel and the, the grandmother, that his grandmother, I mean, uh, it's an actress, the great la darling Legitimus who did uh, 152 movies, 152 movies. And this is the first movie that she did <clears throat> as a lead actress. Otherwise, every part that she had was just like <clears throat> playing uh, dancers or singers or a cook, you know, or a, a, a nanny or things like that. That was her first real part in the film. 152 movies. That's why when she got the, the award in, at the Venice Film Festival, I'm telling you that I'm still emotional about it, when they said, and the winner is Darling Legitimus, to see that all black old women walk on stage with, you know, with at her arm, her little boy, Jose. It was amazing. People, they were screaming and crying, and it was amazing. And that was a premiere, in, you know, in the history of uh, Venice. Mm -hmm. And I would say in the world, I mean, cinema like this, you know. So, and that's thanks to Joseph Zobel, who was that fantastic book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There was another hand, I think. Yes, here. Hello. Thank you for sharing your talent with us here. Um, I have one question. I hope it's not too personal. Did your mother ever had the chance to see the movie, and what did she say about it when she had the chance? My grandmother or my mother? My mother, because she gave me the book, right? Well, actually, you know, my father, he was the first femi feminist that I had in my life, my dad. If I'm here today as a filmmaker, it's thanks to my dad, because I was the first one in the country to, to, to go and say, I want to make films. 
And people will say to him, well, but you are not scared. You send your daughter to France and blah, blah. He said, no, she's an artist. She's, she's from little age. She, she knew what she wanted. And my job is to provide her with the money to be who she wants to be. And that's what she did. And my mother, of course, she was just like, oh, yes. So my dad and my mother, they went on almost all my movies with me. They traveled, they were there. And it was very funny, I'll go fast because I know that time is running and we have so much to, to discuss. But my father, I remember when we were shooting uh, Sugar Cane Alley, and uh, there was one very important scene. And my dad was very quiet in the crowd, you know, people watching the shooting. But nobody knew who he was. And, um, and he, people were talking. They were so impressed to see already a movie about their stories being shot in the country by a woman and a young woman. So they, some male, you know, spectator will say, oh my God, that girl, she is, uh, I don't know how to translate it. <laughs> I mean, she has balls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, I, and I, when I say that, no, 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 I have ovaries, you know. <laughs> She got ovaries, you know. <laughs> yeah. And, and my father, every time he would say that, and he, he said, I was laughing, and I didn't say a word about it because, and he was so proud, you know, to, to be, because he, so, he pushed me, he paid my, for my studies, and he was my first, the first to know any project that I had, my dad would be there with my mother, and I would tell them the story. I would pitch the story to them. And then, I mean, my dad, my dad left me a few years ago, nine years ago, and three years ago, my mother died. But, you know, I know wherever they are, they see it, and I'm sure that they are happy for what is happening. Yeah, because everything that I am, they made me who I am. True, thank you. And we're gonna continue, and you will see who she is. <laughs> because as we said, Silver Lion and then Best Actress for Darling Legitimus, 27 awards worldwide. The film was traveling really well and it was a box office hit in Martinique. And then she received for the first time for a female director in France, not a black director, a female director, an award at the French César, which is the kind of French, uh, the Oscar for France. But then, after that, she didn't stay in France like, oh, I will get money and I will make my films. She went to the United States, invited by Robert Redford, to participate to the Sundance Filmmakers Lab. And then she showed him all the letters she received from major American studios, saying, I don't know what to do with this. They are all inviting me. And suddenly, she came out with a project about apartheid in South Africa at the time where <laughs> they were uh, Nelson Mandela was in jail, where the South Africa was banned by most of the other countries, and where at the time when it was really complicated to deal with this kind of political subject. So, how did you came with A Dry White Season, your second project that you shot in 1989? Well, I, got, I guess that, as I was saying, I had ovaries. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Uh, well, you know, when I decided to do Sugar Cane Alley, as I said earlier, I was, at, I was very young. And I had three projects that I wanted to do, almost four. Um, the first one was Sugar Cane Alley. Uh, the second one was a movie about uh, South Africa, the situation. You know, the more I will go up, you know, I will see the, the footage on the screen and the buildings, the killing, everything. And I, I wanted to make a movie about that situation, to, to bring my little, like we said, the little, um, how do you call it, a colibri? In, the the bird. colibri is a, is a hummingbird. You see the little story of the, the hummingbird, there is a fire, and the little hummingbird will bring its little drop of water you know, to extend with the fire. I had to do that, to, to do my, my part. So I wanted to do a movie about South Africa. I wanted also to make a movie about, about um, um, Toussaint Louverture, hein, sister? Hein? Toussaint Louverture, the great freedom fighter from Haiti. So um, I, did, I did Sugar Cane Alley, and then 
um, what, I had to, to find something to, a book to talk about South Africa. The one that I picked was Cry O Beloved Country from Alan Patton. But I discovered that they already made uh, three movies about that famous book. And then a friend said, okay, don't cry, read that. A Dry Wet Season from Andre Brink. And um, there's a story about, about a white man, an Africano, you know, the awakening, you know, how he saw the light, he saw the truth. And he's a history teacher, and he cannot turn a blind eye anymore. And he decided to, to join the fight for justice in the name of his human dignity. He couldn't stand that, so he had to, to fight it. And then, so what I decided to do is to, in my adaptation of the book, I, want, I decided to tell the story of two families one white and one black, to show in the white section what happened to somebody white in South Africa who does what he did. You guess what happened? I don't need to tell you. Of course, they will kill him. Um, and how he, he fought hard and he tried to, to help. Um, and then what happened to the black family? Um, of course, we, we, we know. So I'm not going to go through that because you saw all the pictures and you know, and Mandela was injured. So I decided, to, so in the meantime, Ruben Redford called me. He wanted me to come, he picked me to go to Sundance um, among 10 French filmmakers. I was the one that yeah, they chose to, to go to Sundance. Um, and it was amazing. I said, why me? Oh, that's great. But I was surprised, but I understood why literally. Um, and uh, being there, we had the most fantastic time at Sundance. It was fantastic, really. Everybody welcomed me like I was a star, and I was no star, you know? But they saw the movie, they saw Sugar Cane Alley, and they loved the movie. And everybody was saying, where is the director of Sugar Cane Alley? Is she there? Everybody wanted to meet with me. So I say that not to say, well, you know, no, no, because that's the truth. And that makes me feel so good. Um, and then Robert Redford you know, became my godfather, okay? So, and he would sit down on the grass with me and said, okay, so now, what next? And I said, I have this project and that you know. Um, and I show him the letters that uh, the studio sent me to invite me to come to work with me because they love Sugar Cane Alley. And I told him that I'm not going. I don't want to go to Hollywood because, I mean, this is scary to go to Hollywood and that's not just the same style of work. We don't, they don't, they have a different way of dealing with projects and filmmakers. So life is too short. <laughs> I don't want to go there, you know? And, uh, but he said, no, 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 no. You got to go because you have to test the water. You don't just shut the door and saying, I'm not going because this, because that. Make your own experience. And, and I said, well, I guess you are right. Okay, I'll give it a try. <laughs> and then he called his assistant, Sandy, and said, okay, call the studio and say, tell them that, uh, it was at that time when a brother, um, I'm sending her, I'm in the plane, go and get her. So that's what happened, and I arrived there, you know, and uh, I, the, I didn't tell them that, I didn't tell the producer who wrote me all those letters that, you know, um, I have a project because they wanted to work with me, so I was, I wanted to hear what they had in their bags. But I have to say to you that because Spielberg was here yesterday, <laughs> when they sent me the second letter, to say, please, we would like to work with you. And I said, no, the third one. And I said, well, maybe color purple, because I just got the book. And I said, okay, if I had to, to work with you guys, this is what I would like to do. And they told me, they wrote me that beautiful letter that I have. I, have them, I, I kept them, you know, because it's important. And I said, they told me, well, unfortunately, we have a filmmaker who is working on it already, so, you know. And I said, oh, too bad, but, you know. So, I'm busy with my own project, so. And then when I came, I said, this is what I want to do, because they offered me something like 10 screenplays put on the table, 
you know, they have drawers full of <laughs> script, you know, that they, <laughs> they didn't do, and they want, okay. And I kept saying, no, 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 no. It's a pass, no, no, I can't. And finally they said, what about, oh, Malcolm X? And I said, still no. <laughs> because I didn't, want, I didn't want Hollywood to use me to do a, their version of Malcolm X. And I didn't want to go through what Alan Parker went through when he did Mississippi's Burning. You know, because they gave him a project, he was happy to do it, but he didn't question things. You know, and he just did it, just like, okay. They asked me to do that, I do it, it's just a movie, that, you know. And then he has to face all the people outside uh, boycotting the theaters and everything like that. I didn't want to go through that. So finally, they were so sad, and I said, don't be sad, because you didn't ask me if I had a project. There it is. And I said, this is a dry white season. I'm saying that to you because I don't want you to think that they call me and they offer me a dry white season. No. I came with my project and I said, this is what I want to do. If you want to work with me. <laughs> if you want to work with me, there it is. They didn't know the book and they kept me in town for a week. They read the book and then they brought me back and they have, you know, 10 women around the table, producers. And they asked me to pitch the story. I did, and they were crying, crying and crying around the table. And in Hollywood, when people are crying like that, they said, oh, this is good, so we'll make that movie. <laughs> this is great, <laughs> you know. And anyway, uh, finally, Cry Freedom came out, and Warner Brothers decided not to, I mean, just to put the, the project in a drawer, like the others, you know. Mm. Uh, and then MGM picked it up right away. And I'm telling you that I had the most fantastic experience in Hollywood with MGM, with my producer, Pula Weinstein, who, who produced that film. I picked that producer too. And um, she made sure that I would make the movie I wanted to make. And when I met with uh, the head of uh, Alan, Alan Ladd Jr., the head of the studio of MGM, I pitched a story to him, and, and I thought, he said, well, if one of us accept to let it go, because you know, in Hollywood, I say all this to you so you know, if they develop a project and they decide for any reason to dump it, it's absolutely a nightmare to, to take the project away from them. They own the, the project. Even if you say we reimburse you, no. Because suppose, for example, that you go to the competitor and it's a huge success. That makes them look stupid. So they don't want that. So it's absolutely difficult, almost impossible. But you know, they used to call me Miss Impossible Possible. <laughs> That's what I did, <laughs> you know, with my producer, Paula. So we, we went to MGM. I pitched my story, and I, when Alan, Alan and Junior said, if they let it go, okay, we'll do it. And, um, and I said, sir, there is one thing that will not be negotiable. What is it? I want the black characters to be portrayed by black South African people not by <laughs> not by black Americans, actors that I love, I respect, they are very talented, they are great. But I think that I'm not, I want you to understand that I'm putting, I'm willing to die, and that's what I told my parents. Mandela is in jail, and in order to write the script, I had to go undercover, it's in Soweto, under a false name, and, 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 I, and I said that I'm a singer and I'm looking for some beautiful polyphonic voices like Lady Smith Black Mambasso. So check them out, you will see, you will love them. It's a group, a South African group, um, to, to, to do a record. So, and then that's how I went there. But in fact, I was interviewing 
victim of apartheid, all men, children, young people, all kind of people, thanks to Nelson Mandela's friend and doctor, Ntato Motlana, who was in Paris, I met with him. And then he told me, you want to make a movie about uh, South Africa, dry white? They'll kill you, girl. And I said, I'm willing to, be de to, to die. I want to make the movie. Otherwise, I don't deserve to be called Uzan Palsi filmmaker. I want to do that. It's important. So be it. So if I have to die, I prefer to die like this, you know, instead of dying from a stupid cancer, for example. Okay? So he said, okay, girl, I'll help you. And he organized everything for me, everything. And that's how I had all the information I needed uh, about the torture scene, what they will do to somebody. Like Mandela, it's, it's not the same kind of torture that they will do to a gardener. I mean, they have a range of, a panoply of, of torture, you know. And uh, so that's how I left South Africa with a tape. I don't know if you remember those audio tapes, they were rectangular, you know, now we have the small ones, but you have the audio tapes. You know, in my panties, I left the country with a tape here. And I went to Paris, I sat down, and for two months, I wrote my script. That, and that the shooting script that I, I, I had to, that made the movie. That you shot in Zimbabwe, right? I shot in Zimbabwe, yes. Yeah, I wouldn't be able to show them. Oh, they would be too happy to kill me. <laughs> yeah, so because she has all not the Not only me, but all the people, you know, all yes. the testimony, the mm. people, you know, it was dangerous because, yes, they could they would kill me, but they would kill them all. So that was, I had to find a way to escape, but today I wouldn't be able to do that with all the machine when you go to the airport. Bing! Okay, ma'am, go here, you know. <laughs> so, but at that time, you know, mm. I did, yes. And as she is a really strong filmmaker, I'm, invi I'm inviting you to discover a scene that we will discuss. A dry white season.
<laughs> very impressive. Can you tell us more about the shooting of this scene, because if you look at uh, Ozan's filmography, you will see that there are many crowds, because she talks a lot about riot, protests, and uh, people's struggles. So how did you manage to shoot with all those people? Well, um, I, I, I work with uh, children. I work with non-professional, and both of these two groups, you know, they are non-professional. Um, and I, I love also to work with the crowd. And um, so what I do, uh, well, I'll talk with the crowd first, uh, how I direct my crowd. Of course, I have a, this is Donald Sutherland, who is uh, mm -hmm. the lead of... Uh, um, lead actor the, of the film. Yes, A Dry Wet Season. Um, before, before starting the shooting, I start with my technicians. That's very important. I make sure that the production, two things. First, that the production, they organize, you know, an evening of screenings. And mostly when we, I direct films that are based on real life, real people. So I, we had food, drinks, and everything. And we have uh, footage of the period of photographs. And I tell them, that I want all te every technician to read the script, that's very important as well. And I said, now, I want you to see that. This is what we all together, we will create, okay? I'm the director, and also I wrote the story, but I need you guys. Without you, there will be no movie. And I want everybody in my team to be involved. That's why I can, for each uh, a job, I, have, I can find thousands of people who can do that all over the world. But you have been, each of you has been selected because you are special. And I know who you are, how you, you work, and you are here. So we will work like a family, okay? My success will be your success too, and my failure will be your failure. So they, they see that, and that's something that usually directors they don't do that. But I don't work like everybody works. I mean, that's me, and that's how I am. So they see the footage, and they feel involved. The crowd, the same thing. You know, I come, when you direct, an American movie, you are not allowed, as a director, to address the crowd. You know, you cannot do that, it's forbidden. You have to tell your first AD to tell the crowd to do this and do that. And the crowd, and then, you know, the first AD, his job is to give the information to the crowd as you ask for, and, and the people, they do. <laughs> I share a little, Something I did, in fact, they never knew that. See if they see that, they will kill me afterward, but it's, it's okay. <laughs> I said, no, no, no. I need to give that fuel to the crowd. So I will stand, I will face the crowd. My assistant will be here next to me. And I will speak with a loud voice. I say, okay, so you will tell the crowd that I want this and that and that, that way, okay? <laughs> And he said, okay, so the crowd, the director wants this, or that. but in fact, the crowd is not stupid. They know that I'm addressing, you know, because I cannot go like this and direct them. So that's how I work with my crowd. And nobody could say anything because I didn't go and talk to the crowd like this. So on, on any Hollywood movies, you will not direct your crowd. But that's fine with me because I found a way to do it. On the other crowd, I can. I just work with the people and I explain why. It doesn't work what I need. When I shot Ruby Bridges, for example, it's a tiny little girl, she's five years old, and she has to face a mob. We'll talk about it after. Yes. Yes, we yes, we'll see the movie. In there. So the same thing, I mean, and that the people, they were so mean to that girl, screaming at her, the mob, I mean, just like awful, we'll hate you, we don't want you here, because we won't see that. We're part of it because we have so much to say. 
And, and at the end, I had to tell the little girl, you know, those people, they are not racist. They love you. They are here because they want to denounce what the others they are doing. So don't be scared, you know? Because the people came to me, please, ma'am, please tell the little girl that we are not racist. We are here to help. But we have to put these bad words, you know? That was because my we question. Are just, we are actors, you know, we do that to help. But we love her. We want her here. I mean, you know, so that's the kind of relationship that I have with, with the crowd, you know? Yeah. Are there any questions or remarks regarding this scene, regarding filmic crowds? Yes, over there. Um, I mean, you're so inspiring, like really. I'm so inspired by this talk already. Um, I would love to hear if you want to share, like, where are there times in your career where you wanted to give up or like felt like giving up? And what, what gave you the motivation again to, yeah, go on with what you do? Yes, I mean, I, I guess that you are referring to the, what I said to the Oscar when I got the Oscar, and I said that, you know, I had to, you know, step back, close the door, and uh, yes, because, you know, it's very hard when you make, you have a project, you spend years fighting for that project, and you, you go to, you knock at all the doors the, of the people who got the money and can green like your movie. And you have somebody in front of you in an office saying to you, well, this is a great story. Oh, gee, this is good. Unfortunately, you know, it won't work. We won't know how to market this because they are black. The lead is black and female. It's even worse. So I heard that so many times with a project that I have been carrying, you know, like a spider woman with an egg, okay? And nobody wanted to do it because of that. Bessie Coleman, the first black pilot in the world, female pilot, okay? Nobody wanted to touch it. And, and I, that was when they told me, well, this is fantastic, but can you find a way to have a white lead and, you know, and she can, she can be there. Yes, this is her story, but we need a white lead. And I said, my dead body, I cannot do that. No, no, I'm not, this is a distortion of history. So they said, well, so we can't do it. And that was enough. And I felt like I had to go home. But I didn't s stay home just like this and cry, no. I was wor working on my other script. I trained young people, young filmmakers, in the Caribbean, in Africa, and whoever, in, even in the state, come to, they come to me and I help them. I did a lot of stuff like this, and I, I was very busy. I did a lot of humanitarian work because I knew in my heart that things would change. Don't ask me why, how, but I knew it. And I was waiting for my moment and you know, it happened with, first of all, France gave me the national, you know, the, uh, <laughs> the, the guild, um, the writer's guild, S-A-C-D. I was trying to find the term in English, but I don't know how French to French Society of Authors. Yes, S-A-C-D, they gave me in June their Medal of Honor. It was very important. And I said, oh, okay, so they didn't forget about me. So they gave me a medal. That was the first sign. 24 hours after that, I got a call from the, from the, the head of the academy mm -hmm. saying that unanimously we decided to give you an, an Oscar of honor for your resilience, your work, the, what you did, and you know, that's very important for cinema. And I said, isn't that funny? So I knew. That, that I had to wait for that. It came. I didn't expect to have an Oscar, of course. But I knew that I had to work hard to get Oscar for my movies. But an honorary Oscar, no, I, I did never dream of having that. But it happened. 
And that's very important because that will help me to now to make the movie, the other movies that have been waiting, yes, in drawers. Talking about Oscars. Talking about Oscar winners, there's another man who came on your path after François Truffaut and Robert Redford. His name was Marlon Brando. Let's see an extract, still in a dry white season.
So I think we're running out of time, so we have to <laughs> go further. But Marlon Brando, how was he helpful for the project, for this project? Well, he was retired. He had been retired for uh, nine years. He didn't want to shoot, to make any more movies and not deal with Hollywood <laughs> either. Um, but, you know, um, I, I wanted people like him, somebody like him to portray the anti-apartheid lawyer. And because he was an activist. And um, I said, Brando got, I got to get him. So what I did, um, I asked with my producer, Paula, um, asked Jay Cantor, who was a vice president of MGM, was Brando's friend and agent when he started his career. Um, and he, they knew each other very well, had a tight relationship. Uh, I asked him, I said, well, I need Brando to come back. I need him for that movie. So he said, well, I'll talk to the man and we'll see what he said. And then how, so he called Brando in front of me and he said, okay, we have a young filmmaker, she wants to do this and that and that. She wants you to, to, to come back to, to get, you know, to the screen. Um, and he said, well, okay, um, I will, uh, I, I, I will give me her phone number, I'll call her. And then, you know, he, he didn't call me for 15 days and I left, I went to France and I said, well, he will never call. And then the very day of my return, when I dropped my luggage in my room, the phone rings, and who is on the phone? Monsieur Brando, bonjour, ça va? He was speaking French with me, <laughs> you know, joking, and, and that how, you know, he said, okay, so um, let, let's meet. And we had that, a screening at Jake Hunter's house, um, and that for the first time that I met him physically. And he, I, I said, he asked me about my work, and I said, no, I, I cannot talk about my work. My film works, talks better. We'll talk better. Watch Sugar Cane Alley, and you will know who I am. He says, fair enough. And then we had that screening of Sugar Cane Alley at Jake Cantor's house. And uh, Brando was really in tears, really. And there is a scene between the boys and the old man, the African man, Medus. When he said that since, you know, he was just so moved by, by all that moment. And then he said, okay, I gave him the script and I said, read it and, you know, and uh, I'm open to any suggestion that you may have. Anyway, to make a long story short, he called me three days after that and he said, I'm, I'm in it. I'm going to do it. And then I made the mistake <laughs> to say to him, well, but you know, uh, Mr. Brando, you know that the studios, they, they don't put a lot of money in political films, you know, so we don't have a huge budget because, you know, his fee was $5 million at that time for even three minutes, you know, in Superman, for example. Anyway, so, and he, and he said, what? You are talking about money? You know, this is not the lead, and it's a very important character, yes, but, and you are, I'm, if I'm doing it and I'm coming back, it's not for money, okay? I want to, to leave my, f uh, my uh, f footprint yeah. on the South African sand. That's exactly what he said. And he said, I'm going to do it for free. And I, work, I love what you did your work. And, and he knew what I did also going to South Africa and you know, undercover, and he said, if you, you were able to do that, come on, no, I'll be there. And that's how Brando ended up being in the movie. And uh, he made them sign a deal saying that when the movie will be, when they will recoup their money, he wants this amount of money to be divided in five parts to five uh, anti-apartheid, you know, organizations. South Africa. That's what the studio did. And that's quite rare. Do you have any questions? Yes. Third, third row. There, there, in front. Don't know who's fast. Thank you. Hello, uh, Rosanne. Hello, Claire. Thank you so much for the wonderful moderation as well. Uh, so great. Um, 
Welcome, Ms. Ante Berlin. Uh, we will have, I will have the huge honor to uh, moderate the Q&A tomorrow uh, at the Zopalast, and um, but we will give, of course, then priority to the pupils and the people that are there to ask their questions. And as you know, I prepared my own. So in case I don't get to ask my question there, I want to uh, ask it now. Also referring to your um, amazing Oscar uh, speech, which I inhaled, um, at one part you said, I don't shoot with my, with my camera, I don't shoot, I heal. Um, which, yeah, was so inspiring, so, so amazing. Could you tell us, uh, could you elaborate on that? Uh, which are the wounds, which is the healing, and how do you do that? <laughs> well, you know, um, I, I always consider my work as a filmmaker as a mission for the world, not just for my people, you know, as I said, my movies are not white, my stories are not white or black, my stories are universal and colorful, and that's the point. So, um, you know, m movies are, you, you remember what I said, you know, in the first, uh, the, the little documentary when I was talking about the importance of images, how powerful images can be for the good or for the bad. But, you, so it was important for me, you know, to, in my movies, to be able to talk about things that people they don't know about, peop also, pe stories about people, uh, story that they dismiss and help people to see themselves on screen, to get to know themselves better and to share with other people. So there are a lot of wounds left by colonialism, wounds left by sexism, all kind of, you know, ism, ism <laughs> I would say, you know. So with my cameras, what I call my miraculous weapons, I'm trying humbly, you know, to address all those issues, but not just like very tough political thing and stuff like that. Using any genre, that's what I, 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 I'm trying to do. You see, that's why I'm saying that I play with the world, with my camera, I don't shoot, because we talk about shooting, you know? But I try to heal the wounds created by history and bring people together. I think we have to end at 6.30, 6.28, so it's really short. So we talked about working with studio, working with non-professional actors, uh, putting on screen stories, untold stories, and unseen faces. Can you please tell us, and as maybe an advice for the filmmakers, how to adapt when the shooting are changing, when all you, what you plan is changing, and expecting obstacles that come during the shooting or during a film project that sometimes take years. What do you advise? So I have a couple of quick advice because we are running almost out of time. Advice for you that I share my experience with you because that's why I came here not to lecture you, as I said, but to give you, you know, information and things that can maybe might help you in your journey as filmmakers. Um, you know, um, First of all, you should know why you want to make that, to be a filmmaker. Why is it? What goal you want to achieve? And you want to make sure that you fight for your stories, for what you believe is right. You treat your crew well. You treat your, everybody, the extra, very well as well. Never forget to say thank you to the people. Good morning to everyone. When you walk to the set, you say hello to your stars, yes, but you have to go to see the crew and say, hey, how are you guys today? You know, you exchange with them. You make them feel that they are just like workers and executants. Mm. Okay, you respect them. And you make sure also that your producers, they do, they, they, they understand and they accomplish that. This very important thing. Make sure that your crew eats well and sleep well, okay? Because a crew ha who had problem of food and bad food, or the hotel is bad, or it will be a nightmare for you after the second week of shooting. And that can destroy the whole atmosphere. 
So that's very, very important. And also the relationship with the producers. You have to work out your, your relationships with the producers and make sure that you pick the right one. Sometimes they impose you the, the producer, but you need to talk and make sure that you know this is a good horse to drive you, to ride you all along the process. Not somebody will say to you, we cannot have, oh no, 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 we cannot have that. You know, like in Zimbabwe, I'll speak very fast to give you that. In Zimbabwe, when we were shooting a dry white season, the title is a dry white season. Okay, it's very symbolic. So at the end of the movie, and in all my film, even if sometimes it is tough, there is always hope. Always hope, this is very important. And there was a rain. I said the, the entire end of the movie with that little boy, and I want it under the rain. That means the rain is very symbolic. That means that is a hope. It, it wants less. That thing, that dirty thing that apartheid was. It's coming. The victory is coming. It's in the script. And then there it is, the line producer said, okay, well, but we're in Zimbabwe, we, you won't have rain. And I said, what? <laughs> I won't have the rain, but it's, and then my producer, Paula, she said, hey, you read the script, right? There is rain there. If the, but ma'am, build the machine. <laughs> and you know what? The, I, I salute my brothers and sisters from Zimbabwe. They, those African guys, they built a rain machine for the movie. <laughs> and after that shooting, the rain machine lasts for years on other movies. And when you look at the movie, and I hope that you will look for that movie, the rain is so good. People can say, oh my God, this is a great rain. Okay, what are that? <laughs> yes, I said, don't say thank you to me. You know, praise, you know, the, the black, uh, uh, the black people in, in Zimbabwe who created that fantastic machine. So that's why I'm saying that it's important because my producer could have said, well, well, we don't have the rain, the machine, so forget about the rain. I would be so devastated. For some people, it might be a detail. It is not a detail. There is no thing in my story that are just, just fancy things or it's a hazard, you know, it just happened to be there. No, everything has a meaning, has a reason to be. And, and also you have to compose with your producers, the people who are producing the movie. Pick your battle. Know how are you to pick your battles. Fight for the right thing. And sometimes you have to compromise. So give up things that you, you know that, okay, I can manage and stick that idea into another scene then you don't lose the idea. But you don't have the entire scene, but the idea is there in another scene. And then fight for something that is crucial for your movie. That's all I would have to say. There is so more, much more, but that, that's very important. And take a lot of vitamins. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and exercise, have strong legs. <laughs> because you will have to work and knock at 20 doors before one open and never give up, never give up, never do that, no. And I'm a, you know, I'm a perfect example of that because I'm telling you coming from that tiny little Martinique to go to France to study, make the most famous film school in Paris and always been the first one, the first black one, that's why I said I'm sick and tired of being the Pioneer. first of too many first. You know, but I'm glad that I was able to do it with my strength, you know, my resilience, and, and, and I would never accept to do anything that I don't believe in. I turned down 200 scripts in Hollywood, 200. And I'm not bragging, say, oh, well, no, because I did not believe in them. And I, that will, I mean, I wouldn't be able to look at myself in the mirror, you know, if I had accepted certain things. And I fought against that, and, it, it, and I got what I wanted. So that's my advice, humble advice to you. Okay? Thank you. So, so, so to finish, c'est fini? Eh? Oui, la lettre, la lettre. Mm. So, um, so done. I know you're <laughs> about to leave. Thing, one more thing, one yeah. more thing. We can yes. stand up, stand up, stand tall. So we, we remember you.
that her film is screening tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. If you accept to stand up without clapping three minutes, <laughs> I will just read. We wanted to go through another project she had, Ruby Bridges, and she had to fight with Disney. They asked her various time to shoot, and she said no, and finally she made the film, but at her condition as usual. Yes. And she received this letter. She never read it to anyone, so she agreed that first we're going to read it for the first down. time. I will do it. We, we wanted to pick someone, but well, I don't know if the master of time will accept. Do you accept? Oh, yes. thank you so much. Is there one volunteer to read this famous letter that no one has read? Please, Natalia. <laughs> <laughs> she was fast. And she speaks good English, so that's perfect. <laughs> so this came from... Oh, tell us. Come on, yes, yes, come on okay, stage. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So can, you, can you just tell us who wrote, who wrote okay. this? The person who wrote that letter is a producer of uh, Ruby Bridges, Marion Ruiz. She left us a few, a few, I mean, two years ago. Yes. As we wrap this film today, I want to express to Uzan Passi an acknowledgement of profound respect for her impassioned vision of this film and her dedicated commitment to the integrity she has felt imperative to the storytelling. As the director, Uzan brought to this film the fullest measure of her gifts, both professionally and personally, elevating it to a level of art. Without Uzan's compassion, generosity, and focus, this movie might have languished in an ordinariness that would have betrayed Ruby and history itself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is uh, ah. My Little Ruby and the producer, Charles Monet. Charles Monet, the little girl, she was five years old. And Marion Rees, the producer who helped me again, like Paula Weinstein for a dry white season, to make sure that I had everything I needed to make the movie. Yes, that's it. Okay. Thank you very much. So thank you very much. Yay, click! Yay, crack! Yeah, Mr. Creek. Yeah, Mr. Crack. Crack. Abu Bu. Bia. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was amazing.